Hello, my name is Dr. Stan Ward. I'm the Dean for Capstone Studies at Claremont Lincoln University. And I would like to welcome you uh, to a group of educators and action researchers who are uh, joined by a shared commitment to a love for action research and an interest in leadership, as well as an interest in, in doing that in digital spaces. And so uh, today we have a working group comprised of uh, Cheryl Getz from the University of San Diego. We have Catherine Atmansky from Royal Rose University, Doug Paxton from St. Mary's University, and we also have a very special guest with us, uh, Hillary Bradbury, who represents uh, Action Research Plus. She's the convener for that organization, as well as the editor for the Action Research Journal. Today, our goal is to create a, a video that our students can use. And our hope is that after viewing this video, that they will be able to define what VUCA is, that they can essentially link VUCA to leadership challenges and appreciate how action research is a helpful resource in addressing VUCA leadership challenges. And finally, we're even trying to do this in such a way that it's our own action research project. Mm. We'll say a little more about that later, mm. but my hope is that as our students watch this, they'll see very brief glimpses of, of sorts of action and reflection working together. So with that, uh, I'd like to get us started by playing a brief video clip that introduces us to the concept of VUCA. And to do that, I've got to move a window that just popped up here. All right, here we go. Hello, my name is Dr. Stan Ward, and I would like to take the next few minutes to introduce you to VUCA leadership. The term VUCA came out of the U.S. War College in the 1990s to describe the new realities of world politics after the end of the Cold War. After the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks on the United States, the term entered mainstream discussion. VUCA is an acronym for four terms that describe a certain kind of situation. Let's take a moment to consider these terms. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Volatile refers to a situation that experiences turbulent and unpredictable change. Ronald Smith at the Center for Creative Leadership describes this as perpetual whitewater, where change happens rapidly and on a large scale. Uncertain situations are those where the technical solutions of the past no longer produce predictable results. Therefore, we can't predict cause and effect relationships in the future with certainty. Complex situations have multiple interrelated variables. Sometimes we can't see these variables and often we don't know how to manage them. So the combination of uncertainty and complexity create black box situations where we can see inputs, we can see outputs, but we have no idea what goes on between these two. Ambiguous situations are those where it is difficult to see the cause or meaning of an event. These are situations where we aren't exactly sure how we got here, and we don't know what's going to happen next. A really helpful text that explains the realities of VUCA leadership is Margaret Wheatley's Leadership and the New Sciences. In it, she explains that we are living in a post-Newtonian era where the linear cause and effect models of the past do not accurately describe current reality, and therefore we must look to other models for understanding reality and for practicing leadership. 
In particular, she looks at quantum models. As a response to VUCA leadership challenges, authentic leadership writer Bill George has suggested a VUCA response where leaders demonstrate vision, understanding, courage, and adaptability. Similarly, the Center for Creative Leadership has called for adaptive leadership skills to address VUCA leadership challenges. All right, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then turn control over to Hillary Bradbury to share some information with us. Thanks so much, Stan, and I, I just love that whiteboard technology. I have to say, I wonder if it's just me. Um, I'm left with this little feeling of anxiety about this VUCA world, and I, I love the fact that um, ambiguity can be a positive or a negative, right? And so there's ambiguous, uncertain, volatile, which could just be really scary, maybe climate change, refugee crisis. And then there's ambiguity as in what's gonna happen now? You know, we've had this Me Too movement, the, the civil rights movement, all these things that are suggesting maybe the future could also be better, could be also more, more equitable. So that's kind of how I step into the conversation. Um, hello. <laughs> and here's a, a quick sharing of um, a definition of action research that uh, the Grand Master Peter Reason and I articulated. It's, it's two decades ago now. Uh, a teeny tiny story behind that. We had a big argument. Should we, should we actually write a definition? You know, all of our colleagues here on this, on this call, we do it a little differently. We may use slightly different words. Should we really have a definition? I won that argument and I'm really glad it turns out to be one of the more, um, by far, highly cited definitions of action research. Not um, that the citation is so important, but what we're trying to say, I feel really is important, that we're trying to get our arms around action and reflection, theory and practice. And that's really what a good leader, I think, is trying to do, because she or he is doing it in participation with others in the pursuit of practical solutions to pressing concerns. So we could simply say, we didn't have the word VUCA back then, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do here. This, um, this, this paradigm, to use that word, is, is very much growing. And it could be because there's a sense that, you know, the scientific method is not able to respond. So um, I noticed on your, on your whiteboard you had not anymore written over Newton, probably one of the greatest scientists who've ever lived or perhaps even ever will live. I would say yes and, like yes, Newton, yeah, because, you know, Newtonian physics, it works, right? I'm standing on the ground and, and, and thank God for Newton or we wouldn't have this marvelous technology. And there is more of an understanding of Heisenberg effect, there's more of an understanding of new science, thanks to people like, like Meg Wheatley. Before um, I speak uh, too much more, let me say that this work of action research is really for any and all sophisticated practitioner and the word sophisticated is a little scary, right? We're always growing in terms of our capacity, all of us. But um, I'm just putting on the screen here from the Action Research site, uh, just two things, I mean, literally at random. This one happens to be about social planning being done in Australia with a large group of people using action research. You know, what does it really mean to put those in need of social planning, i.e. citizens, at the center of processes that affect them, right? And right under that, you have patients joining um, uh, development of their, of their own agenda. That's from the Netherlands. Again, what does it mean when we put patients at the heart of, of their medical care? And in ways, it's kind of hilarious, isn't it, that we don't think so much about putting um, the ones who are the recipients of our systems, of our leadership, into the conversation with us. So that feels just really, really important. Um, I want to suggest that our work right now is very much about transformations. And, and this is a VUCA environment with a, an up 
to a world that could become much more sustainable. It's not sustainable currently, but it could become more sustainable. And uh, you know, these are the 17, these little picture boxes here on the slide. These are the, the 17 um, sustainability kind of outcomes that the UN is calling the whole world to take seriously. And I wanna suggest that our, the different parts of our work is, is about that. Um, to make it simple though, for me, action research is very much about creating relational space. And thank you, Stan, for helping us, a group of colleagues who don't know each other all that well, but we kind of feel, you, you use the lovely word amiable, our amiable commitment to this practice. Um, that feels really important, right? When we're trying to get some work going and we're really in an emergent stage ourselves, you know, what's the relational space? Uh, not so much just trust and do we like each other, but how can we, collaborate together because fundamentally um, the sharing of conceptual space is all the more richer when there's good relationships but much more importantly than that we we need to also move to collaborative experiment right so so that the true learning cycle is bringing together this space plus collaboration um, to go into a next cycle of of things i'm gonna um stop with this one for now because um, it's a nice quotation from Freire. You can't get there from there. You can't get there from there. You get there from here. So where's there? You know, there is maybe this more sustainable, sustainable state, but it's not here. So what's here? Here is my experience. Here is my intention. Here is what's holding my attention. So I think a lot of the work of action research is about asking ourselves seriously, both as individuals and as a group, what really is holding my attention here? And that can also be uh, emotional attention, that can be uh, practical attention, that can be conceptual attention. And then, you know, out of that, relational space, conceptual space, collaborative experiment. Um, I'm going to stop sharing just because I had thought it might be nice to check in on the, on the chat and see what our colleagues are saying. Um, oh, yeah, I love this one from, from Cheryl, the idea that action research is part of everyday life. Absolutely, absolutely. So if it's sounding like it's something out there, I would say yes, and it's also starting with, with this experience in here. And, and Catherine pointing out how, how deeply uncomfortable ambiguity can feel um, to sit with. I, it may be why I, I named anxiety at the beginning. I think anxiety is just kind of floating in the air um, these days for lots of good reasons, right? And yeah, yeah, we have to be kind to ourselves too. Um, so coming back to, to sharing a little bit more, what, you know, to, to be awfully simple about it, I think what's making life difficult for us is the fact that we realize we've inherited a set of systems that are very much about power over, they're hierarchical systems. And it's supposedly inside that system where VUCA is really felt as a, as a negative, I think, because it's like, oh, we don't have a hierarchy, who's in charge? And so this, this concomitant or simultaneous shift to power with as signaled by the Me Too movement, that's some of my own experiments are happening inside that, but, but just generally this more egalitarian democratic urge that is happening on the globe. And it's very fragile as we see, I, I, I'm in the United States, it's, it's a fragile experiment, this democracy, and it unleashes the wisdom of, of humanity, of people. And it feels like that's, that's um, an incredibly important resource. Maybe, maybe creativity is the only resource that truly is sustainable. You can't run it down. In fact, through education and leadership efforts, we actually uh, restore it. But it's not such a simple thing to do, this power with. And I think it requires, to come to Cheryl's point, it requires us to look into our own lives. You know, what's my own practice of leadership? What's my own practice of mutuality? And, and then literally practicing that with our students, with our colleagues, with our clients in the systems that we're in. This, this one um, connects directly to 
to the, the Newton picture that you had, I like to bring it in because I like to suggest that the inherited model that we have, you know, we can't just skip over it, this power over model. The scientific method is also part of that power over model, right? So it made experts with power over about uh, designations of, of reality. What is reality? Well, let's hear from the experts. And that's good. So I'm a yes and to that. We need science. Science is, is I mean, it, it gives us so much that's good in our life. But there's been a huge downside. And part of that downside that action researchers like to point to is the way in which the so-called stakeholders of a scientific question are treated, as in they're treated like they're not important. And I have um, a picture you can imagine it's trying to signal some kind of feminist orientation. Uh, for me, the, the feminist view of the world, which includes the humanity of, of liberated men and women, um, is one that goes against, is one that's much more about this power with and therefore more stakeholder oriented. And inside of that relational paradigm, we no longer want to objectify. We want to talk with. So we call this the second person orientation, different from the third person orientation of traditional scientific method. So the second person orientation working with, but very much requiring and needing this first person work, this inner work, which is entirely absent. This is very important. It's entirely absent in the scientific method. Um, I like to joke, if you read the biography of these, of these gentlemen here, you know, Newton, Descartes, all of them, um, you know, let's just take Newton. Uh, at the age of 14, he had a little romance, lasted just a few days, and he writes in his journal, well, I'll never do that again. And, and absolutely, indeed, he literally never did that again. He was considered a very, a very odd duck, uh, quite non-relational human being. Descartes is, is famous for, for staying in a stove when he was in Sweden, you know, all locked up trying to stay warm, and on and on. It's a little bit of a joke, but it's also, well, if that's what we've inherited, this complete lack of understanding and or sensitivity or even interest in relationship. Well, no wonder we have privileged the so-called uh, patriarchal gaze, this objectification. And again, I probably sound quite, quite passionate to some, but again, I'm a yes and to that. Uh, the third person, the, ob the objectivity, although it's always partial, is very, very important. But action research wants to bring in more of the second person and the first person approach to that. We could say that we're trying to bring back the experiential and the experimental, coming back to Freire. Remember, it was Freire who said that we are trapped inside these models, these banking models of learning. Um, all research requires learning. I mean, really, learning is at the heart of everything, right? We learn in order to do research. Uh, research requires learning, but if, if we have made absent a concern for our own experience, our concern for what we actually care about, the experiments that I want to do, that you want to do, that we want to do together, um, take, you know, take climate change. My colleagues in the Netherlands, for them climate change means they're going to be inundated by water. Um, for those of us who live on the, on the west coast of the United States, particularly down in California, that means we're going to have drought. These are very different experiences, so we need a kind of a different language and in our second person work to be attuned to that. So I think it's one of the reasons I feel sad. So much money has gone into climate change efforts, the IPCC, and I have such respect for some of those people who are actually writing right now uh, a journal issue on climate transformations. Love it, love it. And the fact of the matter is, all this money has just gone to defining the problem. I'd say, you know, imagine if 50% of that huge amount of funding had gone to exploring small group efforts in California, uh, in the Netherlands, you know, what are we learning about transitions? Now, I know that those transition uh, uh, experiments are happening, but they're disconnected from science. So action research, again, coming back to the definition, is about bringing these things together. Right? Um, how, do, how do scholars, in a way, become a little bit more action oriented, a little bit more tuned into the relational? And how do those who are activists out in the communities become a little bit more attuned to reflection and a little bit more attuned to bringing their own experience to insight, to writing? So, all of us have something to learn with and from each other. I would say that action research transformations, therefore, is inquiry with stakeholders and its growing capacity to take action. This is a riff for those who know the work of, of David Kolb, which comes from the work of you know, William James all the way back. It's, it's a riff on that full learning cycle so that uh, we're reflecting, analyzing, 
uh, deciding and initiating. That's full learning. Um, but currently in our systems, I would say a way inordinate amount of effort is spent just on reflecting and analyzing and thereby our inability to respond well or at all to VUCA, to VUCA situations. Um, I think this also opens us up to multiple ways of knowing. This is something that I know at least um, all of us present will have something to share about. I want to stop sharing again there. And um, maybe turn it back to you, to you, Stan. Maybe what, whatever little, little time is left in my talk, we can devote more to, to dialogue. So thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Certainly. So um, yeah, thanks. Looks like I've got the screen back. So yeah, I would love to take a moment now. And since we've got a little bit of time, would ask the group about some of the insights that, that they've gained just by listening so far. Um, one of the things that I, I know I keep, keep coming to is, especially in my work with professionals, there's such a low tolerance for ambiguity. And thinking about also this idea of relational inquiry that, as I reflect, it seems to me that without that relational trust, ambiguity becomes much more threatening and it's harder to trust and, and try these kind of active experiments. Just one of the insights I'm taking away so far. And even having the courage to imagine that there might be other ways to do things, I think can be quite scary. Uh, you know, when, when people are used to a hierarchical or a command and control setting, uh, that kind of a decision-making process, uh, there are some real cultural clashes uh, between um, that, you know, that kind of an orientation and um, perhaps a more collaborative or experimental way of working. And in some ways, if, if one has never been exposed to other ways of working, then it almost becomes um, uh, a, a dom you know, the dominating paradigm cannot always see itself. Uh, and so even to start the conversation about there being alternate ways of working is um, sometimes where, where we need to start. I think that becomes um, maybe especially challenging in some sectors. I'd say perhaps higher ed is one of those sectors because the way we're used to working is in departments and silos. And um, I happen to work with uh, students who are preparing to be higher education professionals. And from the very beginning, helping them understand that they need to have relationships across the campus, across the university, um, and dealing with the kind of ambiguity that comes along with not knowing and not understanding everything as an early career professional sometimes can be challenging, but that's, it, this is the way in which using action research really plays itself out in a practical way for, uh, for our program and for our students. Hmm. Yeah, you know, for me, it's just been exciting to meet all of you. Um, because, you know, in your example, Cheryl, like we have our program, St. Mary's College of California, we do our leadership work and we do our version of action research. And it's just, it feels too important to leave it to just what, how one particular institution might do it. And um, Hillary, the thing that really struck me was your, uh, it can be so easy to demonize the, mm. the hierarchical, Descartian world that we've, you know, that we're living in. And I just really love the yes and the both and uh, thinking because uh, I think when people are frightened and don't know what to do, it's hard to let go of everything. And, and I don't think that's what we're, we're saying. Like, don't let go of everything, but use what's of service and how, um, you know, I think a lot of our leadership work, it feels like we, we have an idea of what leadership in the 21st century could be and what's needed, but my big question has always been, how do we get there? And, and that's what I see in the, the model that you're describing is that it helps us have a place to practice. Um, 
how, how do we collectively make decisions and, and improve our, our situation in the world? So um, I'm really grateful for uh, just getting to be here with the uh, four of you. Uh, and uh, I keep thinking, you know, this is one of those summers where between the fires and politics and uh, refugees and immigration and you know all of the issues that um, what we're talking about we need to be bringing <laughs> we need to be bringing this forward in as in as hearty a way as we can yeah mm -hmm. the, the thumbs up of agreement yeah yeah <laughs> it Doug, that's a great segue too because i'd like us to take a little bit of time to express what we see in our own programs as examples of action research and vuca leadership interacting with each other and so uh, we, we made a list earlier of who gets to go win and cheryl was very excited to be the first one up <laughs> uh yeah thanks sam and others um so just I, I'll try to not give too many details, but I work um, in a department of leadership studies and I work with students who are preparing to be higher education professionals. Um, so mostly administrative positions and they have an action research project that spans the course of one year. And I, I really love how listening to others and, and um, especially listening Hillary, to your uh, the description of action research, which of course we use also and have modified in our own way, that when students do these projects, we, we basically require four things. That they have to reflect on their own practice, that that's part of the work that they're doing. That they also are in community with others, that they're not doing it by themselves, that they break down some of those some of the silos that are inherent in, in wherever they're working on campus. That there's an element of change. So to do this work um, and not anticipate, an antis they have to have an anticipated outcome, something that they're looking to change, some issue that they've been struggling with. And then they have to figure out a way how to share their knowledge and how to give back. Um, we always get this pushback that uh, you know action research is not generalizable. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it is generalizable in as much as those that read it can make sense of it in their own uh, spaces, in their own environments. So I, I want to give um, uh, just one practical example of a student who uh, was working in a community college as an ad she worked in financial aid. She was a financial aid advisor, and the thing that was bothering her the most was that many undocumented students were not able to access financial aid. And so she started a process of engaging with others around some of the technical issues, which she thought, of course, were gonna be solved very quickly. <laughs> this is where the ambiguity comes in. Um, and she opened up a whole bag of issues that crossed counseling, financial aid, admissions, um, and retention issues. And it required that she began dialogues across all sectors. She worked at a community college, um, all sectors really of the uh, of her uh, college, and including the, at the presidential level. And what the result of that work was that she and her colleagues and students developed the Dream Center. So she started in 2015. And um, by the spring of uh, 2015, she, they had the, they were, this was up and running. By 2016, which as we know, was a very difficult uh, year for um, many undocumented folks, and I'm in San Diego, so this is a very uh, alive issue for us. Students, there were over 50 students at that time who are now accessing the resources in the center for counseling, for support, for financial aid. They were able to leverage some of the campus, um, commu other campus communities that were pull pulling in. And the center still exists now in a real way. They have faculty advisors, they have administrative staff. And I just spoke with a student in just because I knew I would may have an opportunity to use that example. And um, she's also got another job where she's overseeing much more. Uh, so it's given her an opportunity to take her learning to a larger stage. She's presenting at conferences. She's seen now as someone who is more of an expert in working with undocumented students. And so um, 
you know, when I think, sometimes when I think about the work that we do, or maybe I do, I, I think it's just such a small little piece. You know, we're working with so many students and they're doing their own little piece of the world. But when I hear stories like hers, it really, um, I'm, I'm with you, Doug, in that, you know, we, we have to uh, join with others around this work to let people know how powerful it can be to work uh, in this way, to do different, to do research in a different way and the kinds of change that is possible um, that our students and, and those that they touch are able to do. Um, and I find, it, I, I find it a real rewarding experience as well. And I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, thanks Cheryl. The, the, what I was gonna, I'm, I'm actually teaching right now um, in, in our course ends tomorrow and Sunday and our program is very similar in that um, it's a, uh, uh, two-year leadership program and they spend the last the second year really working on a final project that is participatory ex experiential um, you know action research based um, and just uh, so one example that just came up in the course literally was um, we have two so one thing different about our program a little bit from Cheryl's is that we have people from their 20s to their 70s from all sectors of the economy um, and uh, so it, you kind of never know what the issues are going to be. Um, but this is a young uh, firefighter, and he has been experiencing literally, you know, the around-the-clock work that's been going on in California. Um, and, you know, he said one of the things that's tough, and I was thinking of your language, Hillary, uh, the inherited model, right, um, of the way the fire service has been set up for hundreds of years, um, it, it kind of has a, this is the way we do things kind of, you know, um, hierarchy. And he said what they're having trouble doing is recruiting new people and they're, they're, they're needing new people desperately. Uh, and they're having to incorporate, bring people from around the world, you know, to help fight the fires. And so in this completely, uh, you know, the governor is saying it's not a new normal, that we have no idea what this is going to actually become as, as climate change, change continues. And so his inquiry is to how do we change our recruitment practices to better meet millennials and attract them into the fire service? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and what's that gonna require for us to change how we are to keep them because they haven't been able to keep people in the same way too. So just an example from like literally the, the fires of, of, of right now, we have another, you know, in the wake of Ferguson, Missouri and Black Lives Matter, the conflict between police and uh, uh, communities of color and um, so we have two uh, police officers of color who are doing an inquiry um, to try to br bring back conversation within the community so that people can get back to understanding how can we make our communities safer and more thriving like to bring that question and you know they're of course finding that there's lots of things they have to do uh, before they can even get to that positive question but They've been set, they started meeting in a barbershop forum, uh, that's what they're calling it, and uh, to go to a place that was a place of, uh, you know, in some ways where communities came to talk about things, right? And um, so they're going along really well. We've, uh, we have a CEO of a healthcare company uh, who is in the program, and she uh, was looking at, they were growing really fast. They're dealing with complete fluctuations in healthcare right now. What is it going to look like, you know, in next year even? Um, and they were growing really fast. And so her question was with her executive team, she worked with her executive team, how can we create uh, a collaborative and shared leadership uh, uh, direction for our organization? Because we can't continue to grow and adapt with everything that's going on unless we do, you know. Um, and the last example I wanted to mention briefly was um, a group of sometimes people will gather together from the program, you know, and this was nine uh, people in the program. And their, uh, their topic was called service with love. And their question was, how can we increase our capacity to provide service to self and others with love? And it had, again, people from the business community, healthcare, education, uh, police officers, and everybody was in a way working their own life around those questions. But, uh, I, I think that uh, 
one thing that action research really does is help us really get, and you expressed this, Hillary, like what's in the now, what's really at the heart of what matters to people. And, and really the, the invitation is go for it, you know, really go for what you want because um, if not now, when? So um, those are just a few examples and hopefully anybody listening that's new to this whole field can begin to get a sense that you can do so many different things with this work. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Doug. And um, I, as I'm listening to, uh, well, to all of you, but uh, in particular, your comments, Doug, and maybe it's because it's August and I'm uh, located on the West Coast as well uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. And um, we've been surrounded in, in smoke, by smoke, uh, for the last number of weeks. So your, your um, you know, your story about the one student who was working in firefighting services, uh, I was thinking back to one of our students who was looking at the, uh, the issue of gender discrimination and, um, uh, you know, gender and leadership, essentially, in wild, wildfire fighting organizations and she was you know when you when you think about VUCA <laughs> and you think about these complex challenges that we're faced with that organizations are dealing with she was trying to get a sense of um, whether people were even open to having a conversation about gender so she was a very courageous uh, researcher and scholar uh, who managed to create um, a, a forum for dialogue about a very sensitive topic and raise issues within the organization that had uh, been masked for a long time. And um, I think it relates to what you were saying about millennials, you know, changing, changing the culture of these organizations is what uh, many of our students at Royal Roads University, specifically in the Masters of Leadership program, are looking to do. And so I, I like you, um, I wanted to mention just the, the broad range of different kinds of organizations in which students are doing their work. So there are some with, you know, I'm based in Canada, so the RCMP, our national <laughs> policing um, service with local policing services, with military, um, and with some of, some of these organizations, uh, not specific to these, in many different kinds of organizations, going back to what Hillary said about hierarchy, even the idea of having a collaborative conversation about what the nature of the problem or the concern or the question is, is a radical notion, um, rather than being directed uh, by someone to uh, complete a, a task or a research uh, project or a particular inquiry. So that act, of engaging people in a conversation about the challenge becomes, um, it builds momentum or sometimes it's met with resistance uh, or sometimes becomes a slight culture shift in and of itself, the very initial stage. But of course, we have people working in, in healthcare settings, in uh, educational settings, both higher education and, um, you know, uh, primary, secondary education. Uh, we have people working in, in for-profit, in non-profit and public sectors. Uh, you know, I'm thinking back to some of the recent organizations um, that uh, some of my recent students were working in. There was a school board. Uh, there was... Um, uh, you know, a food bank, a, a, a mental health association, uh, some religious uh, based service organizations, uh, a construction and aggregates um, uh, company. Uh, so many, many different kinds of organizations. And, uh, and within those organizations, students were looking at the possibility of interdepartmental collaboration. Uh, so that in and of itself, when we're thinking about VUCA, uh, thinking about how to break out of that siloed mentality and work together across the organization to address a specific issue, as opposed to what might be the regular ways uh, for people to work. Um, people are looking at issues of retention, uh, you know, with organizational turnover and the changing demographics in the workforce and how that might uh, affect leadership. Um, people are looking at um, really aligning their mission statements uh, and their brand uh, with their values. Uh, and so um, tightening up the, the behavior within the organization and the, um, and the values. Um, people are, like I said, gender and leadership, 
um, indigenous uh, leadership, um, museum leadership, creative leadership. So there's so many different kinds of options here. Uh, so I echo what you're saying about the, the variety of places where action research is um, applicable and important. Um, another, another feature that I'd like to speak about, uh, I mentioned uh, that this process of engagement uh, is um, sometimes a radical notion in and of itself, but we really do tend to emphasize within the action research you know, cycle, we really emphasize in our program at, uh, at Royal Roads this um, action research engagement is what we've been calling it. Uh, and there, there is a, a follow-up monograph that I can share perhaps um, in the links that come out with this webinar. But the idea that, uh, you know, before we even get to the action, coming together to collectively understand the nature of the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is a, a necessary first step, engaging with stakeholders, engaging with partners, having the people who are the key um, beneficiaries of the research or the key people affected by the issue have a say in what it means and why it's important. That aspect is what we tend to focus. And then that the, the research itself starts to build momentum toward action. And so it moves beyond a consulting report, let's say, where we gather data and present it back, although that's part of it, but actually the actions that people are taking, the interventions, the methods that people are using in and of themselves can have an impact and start to mobilize and move people um, toward action. So often we find uh, at, in a thesis defense toward the end, you know, I'll often ask, well, what are the actions that have emerged already uh, from your study? And uh, the final point to emphasize here, because it's of personal interest to, to me, and I know others on this call, and Hillary, you mentioned it as well, is this element of creativity. And um, sometimes people become intimidated uh, by that word, <laughs> uh, or, or in particular, when we say the word arts or artists, you know, it becomes suddenly there becomes this, uh, well, that's not me. And one of the reasons why I suggest to students um, that they might consider engaging with their participants and partners, uh, collaborators in a different way that might be a little bit out of the box, maybe through theater-based methods, maybe through collage, uh, maybe through photo voice or some kind of photography, photo elicitation, um, you know, is because just as we were talking uh, about VUCA, this idea that the technical solutions that we, we have always been using we can see they're not working. Look at all of the, the challenges we've listed at a global level on this call so far, you know, the sustainable development goals uh, that you had up on your slides, Hillary. Uh, in order to work towards this, somehow we need to break out of our habitual ways of working. And somehow uh, we might consider um, e experimenting or shifting into different ways of knowing, recognizing the knowledge that's present in our bodies, in in the symbolism that can come through the arts. And that these ways of, of working together, sometimes it's an individual practice, but sometimes when we bring it to a group process, this allows us to get to know one another a little differently, shift into a different part of our brain, and shift into um, perhaps a more vulnerable or trusting space where we're, where we're trying things out and learning through our bodies and through our senses. And so I'll leave it there and uh, turn it back to you, Stan, for, uh, for some of your insights. And uh, maybe I'll just mention that I think you might have yourself on mute I'm there. Glad you mentioned that, yeah. So. <clears throat> <laughs> trying to be a good uh, good digital participant and, and, and mute myself when I'm not speaking. Uh, one of the things I'm hearing that I don't know that I've ever really, really appreciated, although I say I appreciate it, is the foundational nature of relational knowledge as part of that action research experience or action research process. Um, I'm a very analytical guy. And so it's, it's hard for me to, to trust that space. And one of the reasons I, I mentioned this, not only is it a theme 
here, but as I was thinking about, okay, what would be an example of VUCA and action research? When I think about ambiguity and uncertainty, I'm reminded of one student's project in particular. She was working in the uh, theater arts, theater manager, and originally had hoped to bring some values-based living skills, values-based time management, mindfulness, things like that, to her colleagues that she was working with because she saw such stress and anxiety among them. And in the CLU model, we talk about cycles of mindfulness, dialogue, and collaboration that then lead to positive change. And so as she was doing that collaborative piece of her work and trying to report in about feedback she was getting from stakeholders and, and, and how they were co-designing this project together, she, she called me really in a panic because essentially no one wanted to talk with her about it. She was getting absolutely no feedback. No one wanted to be a part of this thing. And when she did get a little bit of dialogue, it was essentially, you just tell me what to do. And one, I mentioned that story because it's, it's not uncommon for students to have similar experiences, but two, as we were processing it together, and again, using that creative filter, we were able to see, oh, actually, this is a beautiful piece of data that you have gotten with these, from these stakeholders, and they are collaborating with you in the design by not participating. That tells you, you gotta redesign this thing or try some different processes to get them engaged. And what came out of that was, was fascinating in that it was an online, uh, we called it a VARP, V-A-R-P, Virtual Action Research Project, where folks were able to engage in the online space to take place uh, or to engage in some activities. So good stuff. What I would like to do next is take just a, a few minutes again to pause and to ask our group and, and especially Hillary, uh, are there any reflections coming to mind at this point as we're engaging in conversation? If I may leap in then, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so touched by your acknowledging the, relate, the importance of relational foundation and, and, and you're saying you're an analytical type. And I wrote, I wrote in the chat, for me then you're speaking for probably the dominant professor type who have you know essentially led our now very siloed educational institutions so you know bottom line one your your openness to acknowledging that and it came across in a way that's like hey i'm actually curious about this not like oh that crappy relationship stuff um which I, I think that shift to inquiry, to not knowing, to, to openness is just really super, super duper important. And then if, if I may, I happen to have a photograph of um, a picture that I, I particularly love. Um, it, it speaks to the practice. I, I didn't get to, to share my own example. The practice that I'm up to these days um, as part of what's a, an action inquiry orientation to me too. Well, it can no longer be about saying, you know, you know, you're wrong, men in charge are bad and everybody's a Harvey Weinstein. Although there is a place for rage, so there absolutely is a place for rage. But how do we actually think of this work as developmental? How do we engage, like your student who's, who nobody wanted to engage with first, right? How do we make ourselves more engageable um, and, and my own work has been has been about this and I, I to developmental friendship mostly between women women and men and then maybe the last thing I want to say and I'm going to I'm going to also flash another another slide if I may um, that to to underscore what Cheryl was saying I wrote it down um, this this joining with others to do this work in a different way like we we here on this call are doing this work we're we're, we're leading efforts inside different institutions and there's many of us out there but we haven't organized ourselves as a community and one of the things that we want to do with action research plus is help that along and one of my visions is for learning futures and for inviting people into that conversation I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that and um, so good to be here. 
Well, this, this has been rich. I'm noticing our time seems to be getting away from us. So for this, the sake of our students who are watching this, I would wanted to keep it to about an hour or so. So are there any last comments from our group? And if not, we'll close with a poem. I was muted. I just have one comment, uh, and and it's one of appreciation because I often feel uh, lonely doing this work in my my place, and just to have four other people engaging in a dialogue about this, just it's a, it's really meaningful to me. So I just want to thank you for that. I echo that sentiment. Thank you to all of you. Yeah, I, the, um, the, yes, it's, it's, this is the part that's hard to describe is the feeling at the end when you've been in collaboration with people that, um, you know, it, uh, Oftentimes that quality of being a little different because something's happened in relationship to other people. Um, uh, but maybe people can read it from the smiles on our faces. Um, and, and Catherine, I just wanna thank you again for bringing in the other ways of knowing and how important that is because I think that is such a powerful way of, you don't have to stray very far outside the line to do something countercultural. That's the, that's the good news about it, right? You know, um, but I, I find sometimes my own fear of bringing, having people in law enforcement do drawings or something like that, you know, to make meaning of their experience. It's like, if I can let go of my fear, people are, I find people are pretty ready, you know, that, um, you know and partly because they're feeling the VUCA, they're feeling the, the challenges and, and, and are really hungry f to find new ways of doing things. So, um, yeah. Right. Catherine, could you close us out with a poem and then I'll have a, a final word of instruction to our viewers to, to add, well, actually a request, I shouldn't say instruction, but a final request for our viewers as we do our own collaborative inquiry as a group here. Thanks, uh, Stan. Um, and I would like to uh, reorient that request to you, Doug. Uh, you had introduced a, a beautiful poem um to me and uh and i'd love to hear that one and i think it might be relevant uh for our listeners so would you be willing doug uh to to read sure and i'll and i can give the plug for the book that it's in it's collaborative inquiry and practice by john bray joyce lee linda smith and lyle yorks and um this was written by john bray i believe uh and uh, it's about his experience of being in an a, a action research group. It's called The Roller Coaster. To see what it was like, they ventured on the coaster. What an odd group of venturers, powered to the top by the hamsters in their wheels. None had known what the ride would be. Some believed that in their intellect, the ride would find meaning, but the as the train crested that designed rise, they realized the ride would be more. Yelling, screaming, vitalized, they careened down the slope. Being thrown for a loop drained their energy. Outside and inside that car, they hurtled on. Some thoughts went back to why, others looked only at the second. All else had departed their minds in the rush that enveloped them. Some clung fiercely to each other, some rode by themselves. Eventually the end was in sight. Eventually they stopped. They asked if they could ride again. In the days since that ride, some have said that it started at the press. Others say it started at the ticket booth. Having ridden the coaster, they are no longer what they once were. Thank you. Yeah. yeah jazz hands. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
So yeah, thank, thank you, Catherine, for redirecting that. That's what I get for not writing down who was reading the poem. Um, as a conclusion, as a final request, I would ask our viewers to, to help, help this group of, of reflective practitioners who are committed to action research, committed to leadership studies, and are really intrigued by the possibilities of action research as a way of developing leadership. Please give us some feedback on how we did in the comments box. We were planning to post this video on YouTube. And so there's three questions I would ask you to ponder. Uh, first, what was something you learned about action research and leadership today? Secondly, how was this video helpful? And third, what suggestions would you have for future video projects from this group? Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it and look forward to working with you more in the future. And to, to our group, I wanna say thank you colleagues. Thank you so much for giving up your time. What a pleasure. Thank you, Stan. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.